Hi everyone, I'm Eileen. Uh, I'm the platform manager at Slauson & Co. So I work with a lot of our companies that we've already invested in. Um, yeah, just excited to be here and learn more about you all. I'll kick it over to Mickey. Hey, Good morning, everybody. I'm Mickey Reynolds. I am the head of programs for Slauson & Co. Um, I lead in particular our accelerator, Friends and Family, which we will have some very exciting news to share very soon. Um, as well as any other programs that advance our mission forward. I will take it over to Brittany. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brittany Crockett. I'm the head of platform, so I focus on everything post-investment and supporting our portfolio companies. Thanks, Asus. Thank you all. Um, and introduction to myself, um, Asus, I'm a principal with the firm, leading up the majority of our pre-investment efforts. And a little bit about our firm, we're a $75 million pre-seed and seed fund rooted in economic inclusion. Our two primary areas of investment are SMB tech, so a tool to support the next generation of small business owners and culturally aligned consumer companies, which refers to companies building scalable products or services that are targeting overlooked customers. Typically leading deals, investing in over between 250K up to 2 million, investing in US-based companies, primarily serving um, US customers. We have 34 portfolio companies, roughly a 50-50 split between pre-seed and seed, and a rough similar split between SMB tech and culturally aligned consumer. Um, typically do about one deal a month on average. Um, and then our secret, not so secret sauce comes across in our name. So Slauson is a prominent thoroughfare in Los Angeles that cuts across culturally rich but systemically disenfranchised communities, cutting into one of the wealthiest communities of color in the nation. And so we like to think about the journey that the street goes on from one end to the other to be a, a somewhat of a similar journey that we hope for our, our founders, their employees, their customers, their communities in terms of wealth creation. And we hope to accomplish that in part by the second by leveraging the second part of our name, the ANCO, which we refer to as the company we keep. This includes a number of mission and vision aligned folks, um, a lot of whom are investors in our fund, but some that aren't and are just close co-conspirators. So this bans the big techs, Google, Meta, PayPal, et cetera late stage venture capital firms, notable individual venture capitalists, artists, operators, and founders of prominent organizations that are excited about lending their expertise or opening up their Rolodexes whenever it makes sense um, in support of our founders and their mission. Um, and we lastly um, have an accelerator, which we're super excited about and Mickey mentioned. And if you follow us on socials, you'll hear some updates in the coming weeks about that. And again, give you a quick high level overview we actually gave this presentation to our, um, or a very similar presentation to our portfolio company founders um, a few weeks back. So we're kind of getting the very same content that we would give um, our founders. And so again, we would welcome you all to to ask questions um, if there's anything that you're not familiar with. That's the whole point of this. Um, so really we'll jump into it, working um, kind of top down. What I mean by that is we operate at the pre-seed and seed stage. And so for us to kind of, see what's happening down um, the funnel, we have to look at what's happening in the overall public markets. And so the name of the game for venture capital um, is exits, <laughs> whether that's M&A activity or going public. And so whenever, and the reason why that is, is because if that's going really well, then that has um, effects and impacts downstream to the growth investors, call it series D, um, C and D, and then that should go down to eventually the Series A and feed investors in terms of um, if there's if the public market is going really well, a lot of companies are going public or being acquired, then that further promotes activity and investment. And then the inverse of that is also true whenever there is um, a lack of uh, public companies um, or IPOs and acquisitions, then a lot of folks are very reticent to deploy capital particularly at the later stages, because they're unsure if they're going to be able to get a return in the time frame that they need to. So at a high level, generally speaking, late stage investors, CD plus, they're looking for, for a somewhat um, quick return, if you will, a couple of years, three to five, let's call it, whereas the earlier stage investors ourselves, I mean, we're looking at seven to 10 plus year time frame whenever we're starting to work with the company. And so at a high level, um, just two quick graphs to show you here, uh, basically the, the number of exits in, in the overall market has been going down um, as of the past year, year and a half. There's been a couple um, couple of ones that you see in, in, in the news 
over the past couple of weeks that have, I think, created some excitement around maybe we could at least be stabilizing, not necessarily continuing that downward trajectory. Um, but generally speaking, uh, these numbers come out on a quarterly basis. And so we're, we're in Q3 right now. And so this is a lot of the data. Um, if you if there is which if there is data available, a lot of that data is going to be through Q2. And so um, I think my personal hope is that things are at least stabilizing instead of continuing to go down. Um, and then hopefully let the end of this year Q4, and then going into next year, if there's able to be um, an upswing in the number of of exits. And so again, at a high level, exits overall have been down, which will impact um, the next couple of slides. And again, just to uh, further uh, explain the impact of that lack of exit, you then see a slowdown globally. Again, if investors aren't uh, don't feel confident that they're going to see a return in the time frame that they need, they're just going to keep their companies public longer. Sorry, they'll keep their companies private longer, and or not deploy um, capital as fast as they otherwise would have if the markets, uh, the public markets, the IPO markets, M and A activity was um was particularly high and so here at a high level globally this is this is true to be the case with actually the us being more impacted than globally um i've just through uh, anecdotes heard some founders even talking about going to raise from uh your like european funds because they think that european funds might be more um have a different perspective than the us um, investors right now so again, that's just anecdotal evidence, but overall deals um, and, and funding is down relatively drastically. I mean, you will, I will call out this 2021 bump, um, which is actually whenever I joined Slothin and I can give you some anecdotal stories, but that was a wild, wild west, so to speak. I mean, the number of deals that were happening, the time frame that they were happening in was in my perspective, just almost crazy, um, but that was the way the market was going. And so you have to adjust as investors and as founders. It was a very founder-friendly environment. Um, and now that's that's less so. And so some of these comments and, and some of these stats, you'll see it's relative to a very, very different time frame, which is call it this 2021 peak, I'm trying to figure out where we are now. And then if you have any questions on anything, please feel free to just raise your hand or, or come off mute. So un maybe surprisingly or unsurprisingly, this slowdown globally um, has an impact. And again, it, it starts off with the later stage companies, but it eventually trickles down um, to, to the earlier stage companies. And one of the downsides of that is companies slowing down. If, if companies who traditionally rely on venture capital to continue funding their growth are unable to tap into new investors or existing investors aren't able to support them or to continue to support them, then the and and they can't grow in the way that they need to with with their own revenues or profits, then they're going to have to be shut down. And so we're seeing that and have been seeing that over the past quarters. You'll see what the biggest impact here at the seed stage, um, which isn't surprising. Generally speaking, the name of the game for venture capital is a lot of failures, um, because you're shooting to build billion and multi billion dollar companies, and so a lot of folks are going to fail in that. But again, over um, the past couple of years, you see that increase in company shutdowns has been impacting the overall market, unfortunately. And here, just um, if they don't sh if they don't shut down and they're still trying to survive, then the alternatives are bridge rounds um, or extension rounds. Sometimes they're called or down rounds. Um, a down round is typically when you're raising your next round of capital at a lower valuation, if it, depending on if it's a safe or a price round. And again, we're starting to see that. And just to put things into perspective, you have companies that are raising bridge or extensions, plus companies that are trying to raise whatever, whether that, if it, even if that means a down round, plus new companies, completely new companies that are just starting off for their very first time trying to fundraise. And you have so much um, supply of, of companies trying to, to fundraise and then as investors uh general supply demand dynamics makes it more favorable for us as as investors to um be more picky if you will and and scrutinize um different factors because we're comparing oftentimes we're comparing apples oranges to oreos i like to say and and sometimes it's just we're not uh, particularly impressed with the traction the market whatever 
but it's much easier to say to to have that um, decision whenever you're looking at dozens and hundreds of companies um, as opposed to looking at uh, fewer or as opposed to having to move because companies are getting multiple term sheets and you, you have to act fast and if you want to be involved in that company's um, history so you see that that number of of again bridge rounds and flat rounds increasing um, overall relative to the past couple of years and i i suspect at least another two quarters of this um and again my hope is that we're stabilizing um end of this year beginning of next year but that's completely a, a prediction of mine um it's, this is also a little bit dependent on the overall um, macroeconomic are we heading into recession are we not i know that there's a lot of conflicting information regarding that um that topic which i won't get into this conversation um but if people aren't able to sell um and 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 generate revenue then they have to look for other funding funding sources and we have a question yeah danny hey this this might be an oversimplification um, but i want is um uh, from an investor perspective when you hear of like a bridge round deal coming around does that feel does that just kind of uh yeah, does that feel like a good deal or does that feel like it was a bad deal or or is it not as simple as that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and, and there isn't a straightforward answer. By that, I mean, there are some funds that actually, they don't explicitly say we're looking for bridge <laughs> and extensions, but um, that's kind of their sweet spot. And so similarly, like we prefer to be at the pre-seed and seed. Um, there's some folks that prefer to be at that particular inflection point. Um, there's not a ton of them, but I'm just giving you uh, some examples that, that they exist. Now, whenever we hear about it, I think we don't write it off as like, oh, it's a bad deal. Um, I think it, you have to take everything in context. However, to be able to share that context, you want to have your company be somewhat aligned with that company's thesis to even get to that conversation. And so if you can get to a, pla a place, um, and we've seen some people uh, we're we're big fans of like just honesty and 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 hey this is what's happened this is where we're at versus like trying to paint a picture that's not true and then eventually we get further down the road and and we figure out hey this is not what we thought it was um it, it you know it's a, it's a it's a press preference of the founder and how they tell the company story but if if you are if you raised too little or if things didn't go as planned and if you had to pivot I mean, some of our portfolio companies have had to pivot as well. We're not immune to what's happening in the market. We have 34 portfolio companies. And so just as we're deploying new capital, we're having to manage um, and support our existing portfolio. So so it's just about really framing the opportunity. And um, it's not necessarily labeling something, oh, I'm raising a bridge or an extension. You can you can just say, hey, I'm raising X amount of dollars. And if and this is what I'm building. Focus on the vision. Focus on how it's aligned with that firm. And hopefully... There, there is some alignment so where you can have that conversation about terms and but that comes after that's not hey we're raising a bridge and then some people have a negative connotation and then the the conversation doesn't progress so try to try to show that context thank you yeah thank you all righty so again it's a couple of high level stats and actually i'll share the person um a lot of these you see the little tag that that they're from carta i'll share the gentleman um linkedin who's the head of insights um at carta and to the extent that that's helpful uh i don't very much that but here just to give you another um relevant graph um particularly for for folks that are at the seed stage which is how much runway you need to be raising for um and generally speaking uh one quote that i borrowing from a founder that I heard many years ago is, is if you're fundraising right now this round is always about sorry this round is always about the next round um and what that means is I you need to instill confidence in your investors and your team that you're going to get to the next milestone in your company's trajectory which if you're raising a seed round means raising a series a or pre-seed raising a seed whatever whatever is the case um but when that happens dependent on some some metrics that you have to hit, but then also the overall market. And, and you want to raise enough capital to let you um, see that next milestone. Um, hopefully that's supported by revenues, but if not, then you have to raise enough revenue, uh, sorry, raise enough capital solely uh, from venture capital um, firms in order to get there. So basically the, the TLDR here is that 
it's taking longer uh, between rounds for companies over the past few years. Um, so here you see the one and a half year mark uh, for C to Series A, and and now we're we're well into the two year mark. Um, and this is time between rounds. This yeah. is leaving aside when you start fundraising, because typically you want to start fundraising before you're out of capital. And so you want to budget um, time accordingly. All right. So it kind of will take a quick snapshot of, of what's happening right now or what we perceive to be based on the different data that we have. Um, one graph that I want to show here, a little bit hard to follow, but if uh, the valuation um, is the solid line and then volume is the dotted line. And so I'll focus on the seed here, but basically what this is saying is that the number of deals has fallen drastically. Um, however, the valuations have not. And and I will caveat this with saying that this is Carta data, not all, not every single startup uses Carta, a lot do. Um, so so to keep that into consideration. But again, um, I, I have this as a yet, um, because what this and we can get this into we can get into this in the last slide. What this is telling me is that there are still deals getting done at very healthy terms. And generally, what that would mean is that that's very competitive, likely very competitive deals, very competitive where it's probably still uh, multiple term sheets um, or strong founders, maybe two time founders, et cetera, that are able to to call that um, high valuation. Whereas a lot of other companies that would have and were getting funded two years ago, um, they are not getting funded anymore. And so this is the current snapshot um, that's comparing that to Series A, there has been a correction um, in price in, in prices at the Series A that's more in line with the drop in in, in, in volume. And there's another chart that um, that Carta has out there which shows the impact that Series B as well. And that's more in line with with the Series A. Kind of these two lines are are more together, whereas these two lines are pretty far apart. Again, this is it changes quarter by quarter. Um, this is a quick snapshot of what different rounds look like, broken down by the different percentiles. Um, the pre seed and seed it looks like this is for for pre money, um, but for them they define pre seed as less than one million dollars, and so. Going back to Danny's other question about like bridge and extensions, people, I mean, there is no right or wrong about are you raising a pre-seed or a seed? What do you call it? What do you not call it? Um, my kind of own personal anecdotal is if you're raising less than 2 million, but really 1.5 to 2 million below that, I would call it a pre-seed above two, call it two to five, I'll call it a seed. Um, that said, there's a bunch of exceptions that I'm sure that that's the ones that you see about on TechCrunch because that's the ones that's going to get the clicks because that's the one that uh, the publications want you to see. And those are 10 million seeds and you know, cra crazy rounds. And so, um, again, take this with a little grain of salt in terms of it being Carta data and, and there being some caveats, but it is uh, somewhat of a helpful snapshot, at least to see where things are at um, uh, at a high level. Awesome. So a couple more slides here before just kind of giving some high level thoughts. Um, so this shows basically similar to the last slide, but oh, but over more historical time frame. So here we see 2019 um, through Q1 2023. And what I just wanted to call out is the fact that companies, at least at the seed stage, they don't have pre-seed numbers here, um, have, are raising more than they were pre-pandemic. So whereas a company might be raising $2 million in 2019 for a seed, it, the, the norm, if you will, is now $3 million. Is that good? Is that bad? That's debatable and a lot of nuance go into it, but this is just taking a high level snapshot of that is what it is. And so you kind of have to adjust accordingly. And then you see the impacts further down, um, depending on the different stage stages that you're, that you're at. But at the seed specifically, especially if you see these up, down, 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 the seed, there's been a lot of activity um, over the past couple of years. Um, one to call out is the generative AI space. Um, I mean, that um, I think if I'm looking at the Carta data, I think skews um, a lot of their numbers where you see these $100 million rounds or, or, or what have you. Um, they're outliers, they happen. And again, that's the ones that you typically see and read about because that's the ones that tech crunches of the world want to, want to highlight. But that's not the the typical deal, if you will. And again, um, Carta doesn't have 
all startup data, but it's worth uh, it's worth mentioning that there are sectors just like two years ago, Web three um, deals valuations, number of deals, speed of deals getting done was a lot quick, um, was very quick, and and, and high valuations. Um, that's less the case now for a number of factors. Um, but again, right now, generative AI is is having a bit of a of a limelight, um, or yeah, it is in the limelight right now, and and the rounds and valuations are are showing that. Awesome. So we'll end here before um, opening up to any Q and A that you have on the state of the market. If not, we can jump into any general Q and A that you have um, for for yourself about your business. But I share a couple of different um, bullets here. This is this is basically what I said earlier that um, particularly at the seed stage where you see the valuations haven't dropped as much as deal volume has that shows that strong um, or potentially overhyped companies are still being able to get round, um, rounds done at, at high valuations again relative to the past couple of years um, will that continue to be will that continue to be the case I think it's it's TBD. Um, I think one impact of the overall slowdown in the market is that companies um, are able to diligence their investors more and vice versa, which I personally believe is a net positive. Again, comparing it to two years ago, we would hear about deals and see deals across our desk saying, I'm raising blank, I have blank left, yeah. I'm closing next week or yeah. in a few days, are you in or not? And like, there's no way we, I mean, we didn't do those deals. Um, but but what but some people did and and whenever you have that little time to actually get to know a company an industry a founder I, I think that puts a lot of risk um, for for both you as a founder to really understand who you're taking money from and and also uh, as an investor to figure out who you're getting um, involved with uh, for the and especially if it's the early stages it's going to be a, a long trajectory over multiple years so I think overall. Um, this is, and, and what this just means for, for founders, at least, is that you want to get on on funds' radar earlier rather than later and start to build that relationship and rapport. Um, this goes to that one chart showing the increase in times between rounds. As a founder, you want you want to manage runway accordingly, um, depending if you're post-revenue or pre-revenue. And so determining, uh, this is all about um, the VC market, but then kind of taking it down to a round how much are you raising? I mean, that in and of itself could be a whole topic which you can get into um, because that has a lot of um, impacts in terms of dilution, in terms of runway. But just for the sake of talking about runway, you want to budget at least enough to where you feel confident that that's going to allow you to reach your next set of milestones. Um, and, and what that chart showed is that that number is changing or at least has been changing over the past few years. Um, there was one chart at the very beginning where it called out fintech consumer fintech companies as having the greatest hit. Um, yeah, fintech fell the most um, according to CB Insights. And so here, the, this point is that I think consumer companies, for, for better or for worse, are going to take the biggest brunt of it relative to to B two B companies. Um, again, a lot of consumer companies, are, you they get funded in their their pre revenue, and so because investors are able to scrutinize companies a lot more just given the, the pure supply of companies that are fundraising um, and that doesn't bode particularly well for consumer companies that doesn't mean it's a bad time to build consumer companies um, or just build a company in general but it just means you want to understand who you're having a conversation with what their expectations are make sure, and continue to make sure that you're aligned with with how they invest who they are that particular fund at a high level, this is kind of a, a given, but as a founder, you're probably particularly focusing on figuring out ways to extend your runway um, or reduce burn. Uh, those are those are closely linked in order to manage um, the current market dynamics accordingly. And this goes into the, the second bullet, but if you are able to start your fundraise a little bit earlier, um, because again, you have the, the time frame of between deals, that's likely whenever um, the deal was executed, but the fundraise process happened, you know, one, three, five, six months well before that, um, in terms of, of the company getting in contact with the fund and then getting into diligence. And so you want to um, work backwards from that goal and start your fundraising process um, at the right time period. 
a lot of funders like we just like we saw are exploring bridge rounds and to Danny's question um it's not it's not a we don't view it as necessarily an off the bat negative thing I think it has to be taken into consideration um the context and and what's happened and and ultimately what you've been able to accomplish and in by that I don't just mean revenue and growth I also mean what you've been able to learn um, because that's equally as important as an early stage founder um in terms of informed pivots and how that's driving the strategy and you want to showcase that versus versus pretending that never happened and and not even acknowledging that until and then eventually the, the investor is finding out and then it's kind of a worse off for, for for you and then the kind of the name of the game and some articles that i'm sure you're seeing are just people talking about how uh, funding growth at our is not in vogue anymore and people are a lot worried a lot more focused on profitability um i mean I, I think overall that that is true i think people are asking because people are being able to diligence um more properly i should say you're able to just ask more questions about profitability and get into the models and, and understand those nuances the caveat is depending on what stage you are you might not have all of the answers because you might not be post-revenue um, if you're a pre-seed company potentially um, however, we want to understand what your vision is or what your strategy is, um, and because we want to make sure that you're planning for it. We don't need you to have the plan that you're going to stick to and it's going to go 100% um, as you expect, uh, because that's not the case. Um, uh, everything might get thrown at you and, and things might change drastically, but we want to understand how you're thinking about running your business, how you're thinking about running growth. And that eventually shows itself in, in your model. And then this last one, again, given the dynamics of supply demand, the number of companies that are fundraising, um, we're seeing at least a lot less companies that are fundraising where the founder is setting their own terms. By that, I mean, two years ago, um, a founder was like, I only want to give up 10% of my company, or I only want to give up five or, or X percentage. And so therefore I'm raising one or two or five million and so you they all they back themselves into their own um, valuation and then they go fundraise um two, again two years ago um i'd say more than 50 percent of companies were kind of pricing their own um, their own rounds now it's it's in the minority of probably less than 30 percent um, of companies um and we can get into this people have questions but yeah i'm raising blank at blank um is a lot less common now and and founders are actually trying to build that relationship have that conversation see if there's mutual interest and and I, I will say you can also fairly quickly if you're not sure of a fund strategy um you can just ask them really simple questions that should help you back into what valuation they typically target um as an example for us our average check sizes at the pre-seed are 900k at the seed are 1.4 million and we typically take between 10 to 15 percent ownership so with those numbers, you can fairly quickly back into the range, at least, that, that or the ballpark of, of valuations that we're, we would consider. There's always outliers above and below, um, but at least you have a, a quick sense of, of, of where we're at. Um, and you can, you can and should ask your investors those questions, and hopefully they should answer. So we're coming up to the last 20 minutes. Um, I want to take a quick pause here. That's all the slides that I have on the state of the VC market. Happy to take a quick pause and, and see if there's any questions about anything that I've shared, any questions um, that are lingering. Hey, yeah. So I just have one question. Um, you know, I saw that you have, there was one slide there that showed like the, some of the seed um, valuations were kind of higher, even though the deal, the deal volume has gone down. And I was curious if you have any, <clears throat> excuse me, any insights on, how angels act, might be sort of participating in the pre-seed um, uh, funding environment. You, are you, you know, an uptick in angel activity? Just kind of curious if, if they're getting more of the, the deal volume on um, these earlier stage companies. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't have the data. That said, um, somebody literally asked that question on Peter, this Carter person's LinkedIn, and he, he didn't have that graph. Um, but he might, somebody asked for it. And so maybe he'll come up with that um, eventually. I don't know how that's impacting. I think really it depends on the round itself. So again, Carta, by Carta's definition, they're doing pre-seed of less than $1 million. 
And so there you're likely to have more angels than if you're raising a, a 1.5 or $2 million round. Um, and so, yeah, I don't have, I don't have the data to, to speak to it. Um, my, my own personal two cents is that angel investors, because they tend to be high net worth individuals, they're not, um, institutional investors. They're typically going to go where the, the puck is moving or where there is the most interest. And so they're probably more excited about the gen AI kind of the, the overhyped deals because they, they, like, they don't see hundreds and thousands of deals. They might see a dozen and, and out of those dozen, um, they might get the most excited about the one that has the most hype behind it. Um, so that's kind of just my own anecdotal, what I would expect is that they're, uh, if they're still investing, um, if they can, depending on what's happening in their own personal liquid portfolio, um, then they're probably going to be moving to where it, there's the hype, the hype around it. Uh, Danny. Thank you. So on the, the last point pretty much uh, was about this notion that uh, less and less founders are pricing their own rounds. And you mentioned a bit of the alternative as kind of a founder can say to the um, ask the firm what their approach is. Uh, is, there, is there anything else you'd, you'd suggest as in terms of do's and don'ts on how to approach that? And so what, I suppose what I mean is like, I've heard some investors say they want all of this kind of black and white info up front, um, like we're raising X or so Y valuation, um, or does that seem like almost, uh, uh, I don't want to say bad taste, but does it sound like tone deaf? Would, that, would, would, would it be as ex extreme to say that that would be like tone deaf or a bit ignorant to say that now, or... Is there any other kind of, I suppose, etiquette around approaching that? Yeah. Well, so the biggest cat, the, the big caveat that I've said with all of this is conversations with lead investors, with non-lead investors, they they want the terms. Um, and so by non-lead, it's like follow on of, of which there's a lot. Um, and you can ask, do you lead or, or do you not lead? And so if they say we don't lead, then they're probably almost expecting you to share the terms because they're looking for someone else to price the round. Whereas if you're talking to a lead investor, that's where I mean. Um, and sometimes you can be upfront and, and that's not necessarily a negative thing of, hey, we're raising this amount, we're open to this dilution. I, I personally wouldn't necessarily even say think that's the first conversation um, because generally speaking, the first conversation is like, hey, is is this aligned? Is, it, is there mutual interest? Maybe in the second or third conversation, you you ask that question. I think in the first conversation, if they don't share, you can ask, hey, what are your average check sizes? Um, do you have target ownership, et cetera? And then afterwards, if that's not aligned with what you're looking for, you can maybe, but you're so interested in that firm, you can say, hey, look, um, what was helping for this round, this amount of dilution? But again, at least if you made it to a second or third call, there's at least some expressed interest beyond just a first conversation. Irving. Hi, thanks. Um, I was looking at the information on the slides and it said like the average price seed is in the range of $3 million, which probably 10 years ago was the Series A. Um, if the seed is priced, um, what's the difference between a priced seed and a Series A? Well, so I'll, I'll talk quickly about the difference between so this convertible note, there's a safe and then there's price rounds. Um, each one have a different level of nuances to them. So at the price, that's the most expensive. It's the most timely, typically because lawyers are involved on your end and on the firm's end. And, and typically there's some cleaning up of the cap table in terms of like option pools, et cetera. And so I'd say anecdotal, uh, anecdotally, probably at the seed stage that that we see and or do about half of them are priced, half of them aren't. So I wouldn't say that all seed rounds are priced. Um, at the pre-seed, I rarely see a, a priced round. They're typically almost all, not all, a large majority of them are are safe on safes. Um, in terms of your question, so that's just the distinction. In terms of the series A versus the seed, um, that has to do really with uh, with what the, the individual firm is looking for. Um, what I mean by that is, I think one or two years ago, anecdotally, it's like you you need to reach um, one you need to reach one point five uh, or one million in ARR to to raise a Series A. 
now people are saying that that's what you need for a seed. And now really it's more than $2 million for a series A in the RR. Um, I, I've moved away from saying you need to hit this um, specific KPI and that will make you successful at raising a round because it's one important factor amongst a lot of others. And so just because a company has hit a certain KPI, in my opinion, doesn't mean that they're going to raise, successfully raise um, a round and or successfully raise a round from the investors that they want to raise from. So, so to your point around the difference between seed and, and series A, there's a lot of nuance there when it comes to what business, the sector, the, the traction, the revenue, as a consumer, as a B2B. Um, but just to just comment on the, the price versus the unpriced, Series, the last thing that I say on, on the pricing of the round, I think that's particularly helpful. And this is things that we advise our founders. Um, priced seed rounds are particularly helpful whenever you've taken uh, a fair amount of uh, safe notes, especially at different terms. And so priced rounds help clean up the cap table. So that way the new, and that's why the typically the new investor who's a lead, who's going to put in, you know, 75% of that round, they want to know exactly how much their, their ownership is. They don't want to leave it to be determined at a future point in time. So I don't know if I answered your question directly, but that's a couple of, of data, yeah. different data points. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, also, uh, I think a secondary question I had was like, if series A firms typically are used to taking a, a larger percentage of your company at that round and oh. what are they offering? Um, at, you know, for such a large percentage of your firm versus like the subsequent round investors and the seed price seed investor. Oh, got it. So if you're talking about dilution, then if I'm reading your question correctly, yeah, the, I mean, generally speaking, the, the, the later you get down in terms of, of series A, series B, the less you're giving up in terms of ownership. So, and there, I'm sure that there's some graphs and stats out there that can give you more accurate, but I would say that's changed a little bit, but maybe not um, too significantly to where generally at the pre-seed, it's somewhere between 10 to 10 to 20% of your company at, at the seed. It's a little bit less than that. Call it, if I had to say 10 to 17, um, series A, 7 to 15%. Again, I'm giving a wide range and then there's an image in there, you cut the average in the middle. But as you get further along, it's like Series B, 5 to 10, um, and probably similar along with Series C. So, yeah, the, the rounds, I think, overall have gotten bigger. But I think the dilution, I wouldn't say has gotten smaller. But generally speaking, the further down, the, the later stage you get in terms of the round, the less ownership um, you're giving up. So, yeah, I, I wish I, it's a good call out. I wish I had the stats in terms of dilution across rounds. But the where we have the data points at the pre-seed, again, typically 10 to 20 percent, probably around the 15 um, at the seed, generally similar. Um, and then the changes um, after the A. I know we have eight minutes left. Happy to switch gears and not necessarily talk about the state of the, the market. Um, happy to, if you have any specific questions around your business or anything that's top of mind for you as it relates to out, anything outside of fundraising, feel free to to come off mute. Uh, I think there's a question in the chat. Any recommendations for fragrance companies? Is VC the best option for minority fragrance startups in, in this climate? Um, so, no, I don't have anything specifically for fragrance companies. I would bug, I would bucket any company with um, a physical product or a DTC company. Um, I mean, generally speaking, the best way to fund your company is by not giving up ownership. And so if you are able to fund it through purchase orders, through working capital um, uh, opportunities, um, we actually have a company, which we can drop in the chat called uh, Bags. They help companies access um, non-dilutive um, capital options. So if you are raising a, a um, if you are running a company which um, is selling a product, and you can you can finance it via purchase orders and things of that nature. That is best because you don't have to give up ownership. I had a quick question. Um, that's all right. Uh, yeah, I was just. I think it's like pretty clear. There's been a pretty large pushback in Silicon Valley on DI DEI programs, diversity in general, um, and obviously the VC market has never been. Um, founders of color have had a really hard time getting VC funding, especially women. 
And I'm curious if this environment is affecting, um, obviously I believe it's affecting fundraising for, for, for minority, for founders of color. And I'm curious how you guys are navigating that, how you're seeing that unfold from your side of the table and how you're advising and supporting founders, uh, with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Th th thanks for the question. Um, we actually had another session with our portfolio companies on this topic because, um, particularly after the fearless fund lawsuit that. If you are, are not familiar, um, there's a firm, a uh, female-focused firm that invests, a uh, female-founded firm focused on Black um, women founders that's getting sued right now for, for funding um, Black women business owners, unfortunately. And we had a session um, to talk about it with our portfolio companies. Uh, so leaving that particular case aside, I think if we look back to two years ago, um, which you see the height of the deal count going up and things of that nature. That's also when the pandemic was happening, George Floyd's murder, George Floyd uh, was murdered. And so I think that there was a lot of global, um, well, at least I should say national interest, um, I'll say global around social racial reckoning, um, if you will. And so a lot of firms, a lot of corporations stood up different programs and initiatives. And I'd say that, Fast forward to now, a lot of those are waning. Um, I, I think no one ever really expected and assumed that they were going to be around in perpetuity, uh, unfortunately. But um, there, there are some that are still around, and so I, I think uh, it, it's good to see um, some of those some of the opportunities. I, I mean, I'll call out another um, peer, which is like TechStars and their JP Morgan effort um, for, for particularly at the earlier stages. I mean, we have our own friends and family accelerator, but I do think that there are some, uh, some programs that are now, that are now up and running that um, do serve as positive signals for the overall ecosystem. That said, they're still very, very small and much more is needed. Um, you know, the stats two or 3%, depending on a specific demographic or, or women. And so, you know, these numbers are, are minuscule. And so there needs to be um, a ton more, but I will say that the interest has waned. Um, I mean, us, we're, we're raising our second fund right now. And um, we assumed that some of those firms who initially uh, wanted to invest, uh, especially at the corporation side, um, we're seeing that now the interest isn't there. And, and that, I don't, I don't know if I want to call it that they're anti-DEI now, um, more so that maybe that was just a one time in the company's history that they were going to do it and they did it. And so great. Um, and now they're focusing on different efforts um, or they're just focusing on profitability for their own sake in terms of what's happening with their own, uh, if they're a public company with their stock price, et cetera. And so definitely at the, at the corporate side have seen a lot less interest um, overall, unfortunately. And, and so, yeah, it doesn't bode well for the overall ecosystem. It just means there's, there's more work to do. Um, I mean, we'll call out a couple of organizations that are focused on different efforts. Um, Black VC, VC Familia, Founder Familia. Um, there's a number of others that I'm that I'm missing out on, but there's there's folks out there that are trying to do um, good work, and so I, I would recommend tapping into those ecosystems. Yeah, just a quick thought, uh, Jesus, around, you know, you showed some of the data around kind of funding. I'm just curious uh, in your in your experience, what variables do you see kind of driving uh, valuation caps for at the pre-seed stage, like anything in particular around traction, team? Uh, I guess what variables do you see kind of that are lead indicators of valuation caps? Yeah, at the pre-seed, I'd say the biggest variable is probably going to be the team. By that, I mean, and there's actually um, a chart that um, I saw uh, uh, somewhere that I, I can drop in here because I liked it. Um, yeah, I'm going to drop it in this. Oh, no. I'm going to drop it in the chat. Um, it's, it's a European fund that put this together, but... I'm going to kind of re-share a little bit of what's on this slide. And again, I didn't put this together, so I won't take ownership credit. But I, I'd say the thing that you see here um, with the different ranges, this doesn't talk about valuation, but it talks about how much someone is able to raise, which 
is the other side of the same coin when it comes to valuation because of dilution. So if you raise a certain amount, you're probably expecting a certain amount of dilution, but you see the ranges in terms of where you are with the product um, and then the team. So if the team is um, exited founder, uh, or if you have a live product that you can actually speak to and show, and, and if you have customers that you can do customer references, again, this, this is leaving aside, um, is it a pre-seed? Is it a seed? This is just, can you get a round done? And if so, how big can the round be? This gives you a quick um, cheat sheet uh, of, of what somebody may look at. I think a lot of VC firms explicitly or implicitly do look at some of these factors. I see for us, um, team is particularly uh, relevant along with alignment in terms of our, our theses that we mentioned and, um, excuse me, economic inclusion uh, writ large. Um, and, and then if you are able to have a product that's super helpful, we're, we're leading a deal right now at the pre-seed stage, um, or early stages of revenue, but they're post-product strong team um, with a lot of uh, relevant experience in the sector. We're particularly excited um, in, in that, uh, but coupled with doing diligence and in, in, in four to five meetings um, got us um, to, to invest. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, but it's nine o'clock. Thanks everyone for, for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us on our website. Um, we do look at and review all folks that reach out to us. So thanks everyone. Have a great day and week.